Sure. Good morning, everyone. If you have not already done so, please put your name and your role as well as your district in the chat box. And if you have registered under somebody else's name, it's really important that you um, put your correct name in the chat box so that we can make sure you get your contact hours. So, oh, hold on, let me go backwards. Here we go. <laughs> Thanks, Leora. So you're here, you, hopefully you're here for transition planning, that B13 transition planning. And we are the Office of Special Services, and Leora is actually going to walk us through this PowerPoint. This is her baby. So that was a quick turnover, Leora, but you are up. Okay, so I forgot to update this. It was actually updated this morning with some fresh links and things like that. So I'll try to remember to go back in and do that. Um, so we're going to do brief introductions just of us so you know who we all are, although, although I do see many familiar names in the, um, uh, the participants list, which is always nice. We'll go over the purpose of the training. We'll go over all the pieces and parts of the B13 indicator. Uh, we'll look at um, examples of each section of a transition plan, and we'll make sure that if you have any questions, um, that we will get them answered. So here is us. Here's our contact information. Colette, do you want to come on and say hello again? Introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Colette Sullivan. I'm the Federal Programs Coordinator. Um, I get to work with this phenomenal team. And uh, before I joined the department, I was a special education teacher for 30 years. Happy to see you all. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, this is the wrong one. Carly, you are on the one at the very end, but you're not on this one. So Carly, can you come on and say hello? Sure. That's okay. I am the newest member. I uh, joined the department and the team in July. Um, and before that, I uh, was the teacher and I've done special education, classroom, and RTI. So Thank you, Carly. Sorry about that. I thought I was all organized this morning, got everything updated, and look at that. Jennifer, can you come on and say hello? I sure can. So I'm Jennifer Gleason. I, too, like the rest of the team, was a special ed teacher before I joined the department about a year and a half ago. All right. And Julie? Um, going in my sixth year. I am the admin support for the monitoring team. And prior to joining the um, DOE, I was admin support for a K to five elementary school for about 16 years. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm Leora Byers. I was a special educator in SPPS for uh, over 25 years until I joined the department about four years ago. So... Um, these are some frequently asked questions that come up throughout the training, and we do answer them as part of the training. Um, so what if you don't know the child, they're a ninth grader, and their annual is in September? How do you write a transition plan? We're going to talk about that. What if the child wants to be a rock star or a professional wrestler or a video gamer, something like that, something that um, might be a little bit unusual or lofty? Uh, why shouldn't we name specific colleges or businesses in a transition plan? Can you include parents in 9F? And what to do if the parents don't want to encourage the child to consider employment? That is a tricky one, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, so, But we will get to those as we go throughout the training. Um, Jennifer, I believe, has, yes, she has. She has been putting in the chat box the PowerPoint for today, the procedural manual, MUSER, the main unified special education regulations. Those are the links to those are all in the chat box. Um, and in the procedural manual, there's some specific information that we're going to be looking at today. The advanced written notice is on page three. We'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about section nine of the IEP, obviously, which is on pages 37 to 41. And we'll also be talking about the written notice, which is on page 87. And please don't forget the summary of performance document. Um, if you have graduating um, 
if you have kids who are leaving or graduating um, in June, then that is a required document. It's on pages 82 to 85. Um, and Titus and I are actually working on updating our summary of performance before, um, recording to make it more meaty and more useful for you guys. So here is MUSER, Maine Unified Special Education Regulations. There are lots of references to secondary transition in MUSER. Those are all the places where I could find um, it listed. So if you are a MUSER geek, like some of us on the team are, um, there's lots of good reading in there that will talk about why we do what we do with transition plans. All right, so you guys, I'm sure, are all aware um, that there was a priority notice that extended IDEA eligibility until the 22nd birthday. That was released 121-21, and as you obviously probably know, MUSER's not rewritten yet. So this priority notice is not in statute. However, most districts are choosing to follow it. Um, and if you want to look at that letter, that is a link to it right there. <clears throat> so if any of you are wondering why this is called the B13 training, this is why. So these are all of the IDEA Part B indicators. Our team specifically looks at several of them. Um, we look at indicator four, um, if it comes up, if, if it's flagged. Uh, we look at nine, we look at 10, but again, only if the data um, team runs those um, reports and there are um, concerns with them. We do indicator 11, which is child find, and we do indicator 13, which is transition in the IEP. So that's what we're gonna work on today. Um, and if you, would like to have a copy of these, this is where I got these, this specific, specific list, if you would um, like to have that. So the purpose of today is to develop compliant and effective secondary transition plans showing meaningful movement. That meaningful movement is a big piece. When David Emberley talks about um, due process cases related to transition, very often those cases are related to plans that were stagnant, that were not um, dynamic, they didn't show meaningful movement. So um, the more information, the more robust your plan can be, that's my favorite word as it applies to transition planning, um, the, better, uh, the better it is for the child, the better the, 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 it, the outcome is improved. So at the core belief of what we're doing today, that all people and their families have the right to live, love, work, play, and pursue their life aspirations in their community. So that is regardless of any disability categories that they may have. So I know you guys have heard this story before, at least some of you have, because those familiar names are in that our participation list. Roberta Lucas and Paulette and I were very um, lucky a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, to go to Seattle to an NTACT um, conference. And NTACT is the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition. And you'll find some of their resources today. We use them a lot. Um, and they talked about what it means to have a meaningful day. And when we're talking about folks with developmental disabilities or the most significant cognitive disabilities, we really want to keep in mind that their meaningful day is just as meaningful for them and, and um, it might look different than a meaningful day is for us. Um, so that could include work, you know, work opportunities for them, um, opportunities for optimum health, learning to be self-empowered and having personalized relationships, developing skills and maintaining those skills, employment, educational, social and community inclusion activities that are directly linked to their vision, goals and desired personal outcomes. 
Um, so this really is about creating a meaningful plan that can um, help a student with disabilities transition into post-secondary life in a more meaningful way. So what makes life meaningful? I used to put this um, as a prompt and we would get answers in the chat box. And these are, this, these are the ones that we got the most often. Family and friends, employment, uh, money and self-worth come from employment sometimes. Engage in, engagement in the community, being able to go for a walk or sit outside in the yard. Those are things that some of us might take for granted, but if folks are living in a group home, for instance, they may not be able to do that whenever they want to be able to do it. Um, a happy home, having pets, your health, choices and options like what to eat, how to arrange your home. And again, if we talk about people who are in residential living, they might not have choices with those types of things and our freedom and independence. Those are all things that make life meaningful. So how to live a meaningful life? Here are some inspiring ideas to find meaning. Um, know what's important to you for you. And we do that with our students through transition assessments. We do the assessments to find out what is important to them. We do those assessments to find out their passion, their purpose, there's different um, activities that we can help our students do to be more self-aware, to focus. Um, another thing to have a meaningful life is to spend money on people more than things. And I think that was something that kind of came out of COVID even more. We realized how much that time at home with our family, it might've been hard sometimes, but it was also pretty special. Living with compassion, finding a way to give back, simplifying life and setting daily goals. So those are all things that um, we can help our students do to be able to figure out what a meaningful day is for them. So what is the big picture? What are some guiding questions that we can be asking ourselves as we go through the transition process with our students? What is it that you're actually doing to support this student or youth? Um, are you doing activities with them or are you just filling out the paperwork because there's an IEP due next week? What assessments are being used? As many of you know, if you've been here before, we've got lots of assessment resources at the end of this PowerPoint that are free and easy to use. How are you applying the results? You've heard us talk about this a lot when we talk about data. Getting the assessments and looking at, um, you know, what those answers are with the assessments, you need to use the information if it's going to be meaningful for you. Um, are the activities and services meaningful? Are you um, able to, you know, steer the child into directions where they can practice things that they want to be able to do? And will what you're doing really help the student to achieve their post-secondary goals and enjoy a quality of life and meaningful day? Time is of the essence. And you folks that are still, you know, in the, plugging along in the classroom, hats off to you. This is a tough time. And I know that time is even more precious in your day with staffing issues and so on. But that's more reason to make the time that you spend doing this work with your students actually mean something. Okay, anything in the chat box before we go on to the indicator? I am not seeing anything in the chat box. All right, well folks, I hope that as we go through the indicator, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box and we'll make sure they are answered. Okay, so these are the components of the B13 indicator. The issue with, the, with this indicator that is sort of my kryptonite is that every single piece of the indicator needs to be compliant in order for the transition plan to be 100% compliant. So we need to make sure that all of these parts are um, you know, accounted for and compliant for um, to be able to put that data in as 100%. And remember, this is one of the indicators that we report to OSEP annually. So the first component is the purpose of the meeting, and we look at the advance written notice for that. 
We look also in the advance written notice to make sure that the child was invited to the meeting. Some districts send the child their own advance written notice. Other ones put them in the salutation with their guardian or parents. Um, minimally compliant is to make sure they're in the list of the folks invited on the back of the advance written notice. Um, the agency invited with parents prior written consent, we look in the written notice and in 9G. So if we get to 9G and we see that, um, you know, the child is involved with a workforce development um, uh, case manager, then we would be like, oh, okay, let's look back at the um, prior written consent, make sure the parents were okay with that. Let's look at the written notice, et cetera. Uh, we look in the written notice to make sure that there's a conversation about the post-secondary goals being updated annually. Um, we look in the IEP in section 9B to make sure that there are assessments there. Um, the IEP 9D and section 5, we look for that alignment between the measure measurable post-secondary goals in education training, employment, and in independent living. Although independent living is one of two pieces of this plan that can be NA. If you have a child that you're not concerned with them needing any extra support there, that's fine. The other place you can put NA is in NG if there are not other folks who are working with the child. Course of study is in the IEP in 9E and the transition services are in 9F and we're gonna talk about them not being child will statements. So when we get to section three of the IEP, you've got this little box about asking whether the child is in ninth grade or above, or are they 16 years or older? And if yes, section nine should be completed before completing the remainder of the IEP. Best practice would be when you get to this, you turn to the transition plan in section nine, and that drives the bus for the rest of the IEP programming. Um, we're not attending your meetings, so uh, you know we're, we're not monitoring for that, obviously. <laughs> but when the child has a transition plan, it should inform the rest of the programming as much as possible. So as you know, IDEA says that the child needs the post-secondary transition plan at age 16. So when you're in cohort and we are looking at your, your transition plans, we need to look at kids that are teen um, and not graduating seniors. MUSER, Maine Unified Special Education Regulation, says no later than ninth grade, which is fantastic. I love that Maine goes above and beyond what IDEA likes. So post-secondary plans are only for children with a disability beginning during their ninth grade year. However, we need to remember that research continues to show us that beginning transition planning earlier results in better post-secondary outcomes for students with disabilities. So the sooner we start those conversations and the assessments, um, the more positive uh, the post-secondary transition outcomes can be. So it's very important if you have a student who you believe will be um, a good fit for extended eligibility, whether it's a fifth year or a sixth year, et cetera, to begin that planning as early as possible. Begin those discussions with the IEP team and make sure that those discussions are documented very clearly in the written notice as early as possible. So this is an NTACT resource. This is the Taxonomy for Transition Programming 2.0. So these are the pieces that work together to make a successful transition plan. So we really need to look at family engagement. We want the family to be part of the team, be empowered, be involved in the process program structures, what's going on with evaluation, planning, policies and procedures, what's the school climate, interagency collaboration, that's a big one. We have a lot of different case management organizations, 
Um, and I'm oh, voc rehab, for instance, could be involved. So those are conversations that you, you wanna have those folks at the table and make sure that the child is getting access to all of the resources that they can. Student development would be, a part of that would be assessment. What are their academic skills? What are their life, social, and emotional skills? What are their employment and occupational skills? What kind of supports do they have? And what is their instructional context? What are, what are they learning? Um, and the other piece is the student focus planning. And I kind of wish I had started with this one rather than going to one o'clock on this little circle, but that's all right. So student focus planning on the IEP development, planning their strategies and participation. That is huge. So here is just the example of what the first part of the transition plan looks like in section nine. No surprises there for folks. So one of the indicator pieces is inviting the child to the meeting in the advance written notice. So this is one example of how that can be done. Mom, dad, and Bobby. Section 9A of the transition plan is asking about the month and year of the child's graduation or uh, program completion. So as you know, once FAPE ends, the IEP ends. So if they graduate or with either a diploma or a certificate of attendance, or if they go all the way to that extended eligibility 22, that's when that access to FAPE ends. So you just record the month and the year of the um, anticipated departure of high school. If the child becomes credit deficient, the projected date can change. Like if the team decides, you know, when they're a junior, that maybe having one more year would be helpful for them. Then again, you, you want to plan as, as early as you possibly can, but that can certainly and does happen. So um, just making sure that that's well documented and the course of study is extended. So here's what that section looks like in 9A. Anything in the chat box? No, nothing in the chat box. Nothing in the chat box, all right. So we're gonna talk about transition assessment for a bit, what it is. It's ongoing and cumulative. Um, you don't, it's not just a one and done. It's individualized. It should be based on the student's strengths, needs, interests, and goals. It's a process that increases student self-awareness and it's used to develop appropriate annual and post-secondary goals. Because remember, you wanna use the information that you get from the transition assessment. So what it's not, it's not the same for all students, it really shouldn't be. It shouldn't be done once a year. It should um, hopefully be done several times throughout the year. It's not only completed just before the IEP to fill out the forms, and it's not only the responsibility of the special education teacher. We really encourage you, most districts have some sort of um, guidance or uh, you know, some sort of activity that talks about, um, you know, getting ready for work or college or, you know, whatever that is, it's probably, it's likely that your special education kids might be participating in that as well. So you can take that information and include it in the IEP. So when we're looking at assessments, we want to think about these questions. Whose needs are being met? What did the student and family and you learn from the assessment process? Where do you record the information? How is it interpreted? And how do you utilize the information? What do you do with it? It should help you plan out the goals for the student to, in the best of your ability, get them to those post-secondary goals. So here are just some suggestions about what to assess, social skills, independent living skills, self-advocacy skills, temperament and personality. Those are just, you know, just a few examples of some things that would um, be helpful in the assessment process. 
So what are some acceptable transition assessments? SATs, PSATs, ASVABs, Accuplacers. What are some assessments that don't have transition components? The NUIAs, the MEAs, the WISPs, Wyatts, Woodcock Johnsons, curriculum-based measures, et cetera. Those don't have transition components. So you can document all your transition assessments that have already been completed. Could be an informal student interview. That's, that's pretty much, I don't know that you could sort of get lower on the, on the, the, uh, the spectrum of assessments other than an informal student interview because that's where you're just sitting down and talking with the child. So that would be something that would probably be an annual thing. A parent survey, um, those uh, skills, the academic, independent living skills, career in interest inventory, self-assessments, career vocational interest and skills. Those are all types of assessments that you could use. So where do you put this information? Our suggestion, and this is optional but not recommended, but if you want to get, see us get excited on a site visit, let us turn to 4A and there's some transition assessments there. We all get excited at the table and we're like, ah, um, let's put a little summary in 4A with the rest of the results of all evaluations. Doesn't have to be anything too wordy. Um, just, you know, that the child took thus and such assessment and this is what happened. Um, why provide a summary? Because it shows movement towards those post-secondary goals. And the more you show movement, the, the better off it is for everybody. So this is pages 37 and 38 from the procedural manual. And it's talking about those transition assessments. And again, here's the rest of that page 38 talking about transition assessments. Um, and yeah, I think this is all information that I've already talked about, so here we go. All right, so 9B, this is where you put just the name and the year that you gave the assessment. So for 9B, the child had an informal student interview in 2020, a career interest inventory in 2021, and a classroom observation in 2020. So what would that look like in section four? And as you can see, it's just a couple of sentences to put in 4A. So uh, for example, in January of 2021, the child took a, well, the student took a career interest inventory and the results showed that Dan enjoys hands-on projects and is good with technology and that supports his continued exploration of marketing or carpentry. So you can see that's just a couple of sentences talking about, um, you know, that career interest inventory and how it, it supports, um, you know, what his ideas of post-secondary life should be. Anything in the chat box, Jennifer or Carly? I'm oh, not seeing anything. Okay, perfect. All right, 9C, the IEP meeting. You just need a statement if they attended and if they did not attend the IEP meeting. If the child did not attend, state when you met with them and that their post-secondary goals were discussed. So here's an example for 9C, Dan attended his IEP meeting or Dan chose not to attend his IEP meeting. He met with his teacher on 5-15-21 to talk about his post-secondary interests and preferences. So section 9D, the measurable post-secondary goals. This is where you document the formal and or informal training the child will receive after high school that enables them to make progress towards pursuing a career in their chosen field. This is a will statement, okay? This is where you, you're gonna use that will statement. And here we have four different examples of four different kids. So the first one is that after graduation, Dan will attend a four-year college or university to study marketing or receive on-the-job training to become a carpenter. 
So why did we not say that Dan will attend Bates College? Because uh, we our guidance is to be generically specific. Um, if you say that Dan will attend Bates College and Dan doesn't get accepted to Bates College, there has been uh, due process issues in, in, uh, in our country that parents were not pleased with that and had some complaints about it. So that's why our guidance is to say four-year college or university rather than the name. It would be the same if we were talking about, you know, child will get a job in a fast food restaurant rather than McDonald's, generically specific. So the second example is that after graduation, Dylan will attend a community college and will study sports facility management. After graduation, Brooke will attend a post-secondary institution for marine biology or zoology. And after high school, Roy will receive on-the-job training in a pet store or a farm. So then you take those education training goals and you make them into aligned employment goals. So after graduation, Dan's going to work in the field of marketing or as a carpenter. Dylan is going to be employed as a sports facility manager. Brooke will be employed as a marine biologist or a zoologist. And after high school, Roy will be employed in a pet store or on a farm. Oh, there's a question in the chat box. This is exciting. Okay. For 9C, what is an appropriate statement if the child is not able to discuss their transition plan because of their developmental level and nonverbal language status? So that's a really great question. So um, I would ask, how does the child communicate? Um, can you use their um, picture exchange system with them? Do they have, um, you know, I can't remember what that, you know, a device like a, um, a voice device. Um, can their parents be involved with conversations about planning for them? Um, Jennifer, did you do transition planning with your kids or were they little? No, I did transition planning for a couple of my kids. Um, the, Typically, I did um, parent interviews or I had some like parent checklists to fill out. Yeah. Hope that's helpful, Lynn. Okay. This. All right. You got it. All right. So what if the child wants to be a professional video gamer? This is what I was talking about earlier with the FAQ or they wanna be the professional wrestler or you know, what have you. So one thing you can do is really do career exploration on the skills that a professional video gamer needs. Let the kids do research on what that really means. Where would they work? What would their salary be? What is the education needed for that job? See if you can job shadow somebody who is a professional video gamer or somebody who works at GameStop and sells games, something like that. See if you can interview people. You know, you, you'd be surprised when you reach out to people. Um, you know, a lot of times they're willing to talk to a kid, you know, about what's going on with their job and they'll, they'll help them out. Um, see if any relatable jobs like testing a game or designing games or working at, you know, a game store would be something that the child would be interested in. So it's really about, you know, having the child on that journey to figure out, you know, is this, this is what this really is in practice. Is this really what I want to do and, and helping them figure that out. So the independent living is the part for 9D that you can say NA. If for instance, you have a child with specific learning disability, who doesn't have a lot of functional needs. But we also want to keep in mind that pretty much all kids of, of this age need some, um, need some preparation for the real world, for budgeting and bills and things like that. So even if they are a child with not a lot of functional needs, they still might need to know this information. So if you're looking at whether the child needs that independent living goal, Consider if they're able to live independently. Are they able to, you know, shower themselves and understand, you know, about how to keep a house clean? Or can they budget and pay bills 
Um, what kind of support services do they need or do they have in place that would help them out with those decisions? So here is some examples of the independent living piece. So after graduation, Dan will access mental health supports in his community independently or with assistance from his parents. After graduation, Dan will ma manage a budget independently or with assistance from his parents. And after high school, Roy will live semi-independently with a roommate in an assisted living apartment with support. All right, there's nothing new in the chat box, but if anyone wants to see us get excited again, you could put in a question. <laughs> okay, section five, annual goals. We need to make sure that whatever the post-secondary goals are, that they are aligned to at least one annual goal in section five. You can use an existing goal. In fact, we encourage you to use an existing goal because your job is hard enough without making up a transition goal. Um, use what's already there if it makes sense. So the goal could address all areas. The statement could include education, employment, and independent living. You could have a separate goal for each, whatever's gonna work for you. And this is just a visual that talks about it. You could have one academic goal that's for education training, another one for employment, a functional one for independent living, or you can add this language to one goal and you have alignment, you've met clients. So we're gonna spend the next few slides giving some examples of what this looks like in practice because you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So by June 15th, 2022, in preparation for college and career readiness, given direct instruction, pre-teaching and rehearsal, Dan will participate in conversation and collaborate with peers, building on others' ideas and clearly expressing his own ideas in three out of five opportunities as measured by a communication rubric in class. I assure you that communication rubric is stapled to this IEP, so that goal is measurable. So this was a goal that was already in Dan's IEP. And it totally makes sense that if he's going to be in marketing or carpentry or whatever he's going to do for post-secondary life, being able to have a conversation with people and express his ideas will help him be more prepared and be more successful. So here's an, another example. By June 2022, given consultation services in preparation for working in marketing or carpentry, Dan will write informative essays to examine complex concepts through organized analysis of content with 90% accuracy as measured by district adopted writing curriculum. Um, so you can actually see that he's right now, his present level, he's at 70%. We're going to work to get to 90%. And that goal was already in his IEP. We just added the language in preparation for working in marketing or carpentry. And that aligned to that um, employment goal. So here's another example. Given social work services in preparation for attending a four-year college or university to study marketing or for work in the carpentry field and independent living. So Dan is an anxious guy, as we'll, we'll get to know that a little bit more in a few slides, but he's an anxious guy, so he's got social work as a related service. So being able to work on his anxiety using his coping skills will be hugely helpful for him in post-secondary life. And you can see that by adding that bolded, underlined, underlined, made up a new word, underlined language, we got as much bang for our buck with this one goal as possible because it's aligned to everything. Here's another example and it's the last one. So Dan also gets speech and language services. So in preparation for attending a four-year college or university to study marketing or for work in the carpentry field, Dan will improve his intelligibility to 90% by using appropriate phrasing and sentence production, pitch, volume, rate, and stress as measured by speech and language services and teacher observation. 
So again, this is a goal that was already in his IEP and it makes perfect sense that to be successful, aligning his post-secondary goal in section nine to this with that language checks the box off. So now we have alignment between five and nine. Course of study. So the course of study should be multi-year through exit. It should be specific and individualized and directly linked to the post-secondary goals. And it should address all the goals that are identified for the child. So here is page 39 of the procedural manual that talks some more in some more detail about um, some, uh, some ideas to keep in mind as you do the course of study. So it should be tailored as much as possible to the future plans of the child. And it's vital that planning for high school years beyond year four begin as early as possible. I know I already said that, but it's super important. We don't want our kids to be juniors and then have them all of a sudden know that they've got, you know, three more years of high school instead of one. Um, and that can also be a surprise for families as well. So the sooner you can have those conversations and document, the more the team is going to be on the same page. So here we have two different courses of study. So we have Dan, he's the guy who's getting, um, he's interested in marketing or carpentry. You can see that this is pushed out from ninth grade all the way to 12th. We encourage you to leave the years on. Don't take them off from year to year. Um, but you can see that, let's see. So in 11th grade, he's taking intro to business and carpentry one. So what if Dan's a freshman and we've done all this assessment and he's thinking business and carpentry, awesome. And then we sit down with him, you know, three months later and he's like, you know, I think I would rather go into uh, computer programming. Okay, that means that at his next annual, you don't have to amend anything in the middle, but at his next annual, you can update the course of study, update the language in section nine and the, and the goals of section five to what the child's current um, ideas are for their post-secondary life. So we have Roy here. You can see that Roy transferred into this district in 11th grade. So we're not expecting you, if this happens, to go back and look at ninth and 10th grade transcripts. Your jobs are hard enough. So just put the years on that you have responsibility for, for example, for that transition plan. And you can see that, you know, Roy's, um, you know, his course of study is a little bit more adaptive. It's more of a functional life skills approach. Um, but the language used in here is directly from the school or course catalog. All right, any questions about the course of study? Nope. All right, 9F, 9F, 9F. I can't even tell you how annoying 9F is. So when we have transition plans that do not meet compliance, I am gonna hazard a guess that so many more times it's 9F than anything else. Like This is it. So this is the prompt on the IEP that they're cert describe the activities provided by the adults in the school and in the community that will enable and promote the child's progress towards meeting annual and post-secondary goals. That's why we say, please do not put child will statement. Because if you have, Jennifer will participate in Girl Scouts, but the prompt is that the activities are provided by the adults in the school and the community, that's a disconnect and we don't wanna see a disconnect. So I have some ideas for you. We're gonna to get to them in a couple of slides, but for these activities, you would include their special education, general education, if they're doing career prep classes or guidance classes, count those in here. Related services, services from other agencies, 
services provided by families as appropriate to the child's needs. And they should be specific and individualized. So everybody's transition plan shouldn't look the same. There might be overlaps because of courses, but they shouldn't all look the same. So this documents the services and activities occurring during the life of this IEP being provided by an adult in the school or the community, and they can help the child focus on what they want to do. So they should not be child will statements. They shouldn't include the future activities. So you leave the previous years on and you put the current years on, but you don't go past. You're not projecting out like you are in the course of study in 9E. So here is the procedural manual, page 40, and it gives lots of different um, services for each section. So these are some um, services that, have, that could be in the education instruction examples, social work, school nurses, um, the fact that they've completed need, needed courses, psychological services, SDI. Here are some ideas for the career employment and other post-secondary independent living objectives. So it could be an internship, job seeking and keeping skills, job site training, registering to vote, filing taxes, renting a home, accessing medical services, or filing for insurance for adult services and social security. And again, this is from the procedural manual of page 40. So some community experiences, they could be banking, shopping, any community-based work experiences, transportation, any recreational activities that the child is involved in. All right, so we talked about this, we talked about this, okay. So here is an example. You'll notice that it's a bulleted list. We love bulleted lists on the monitoring team. They make us inordinately happy. And you can see that we left the years on um, and just projected out this IEP. So Dan had social work services to learn to regulate his emotions in 2020, 2021, and they're gonna continue in 2022. He took financial math to develop financial awareness in 2020. He had special ed consult in 20 and 22. He did his intro to business class in 20 and he had his carpentry class in 22. And then for career um, employment, he did career interest inventories in marketing and carpentry in 2020. He participated in career prep activities through the advisor advisory program in 2021. And he job shadowed, or he's going to job shadow individuals in carpentry and marketing um, in 2022. So community experiences, a college or career fair, any volunteer experience or recreational activities would be good. And one thing to keep in mind is we're looking at the community piece of this post-secondary transition plan is how is the student going to engage in the community? Can they do that independently? Are they going to need family support? Are they going to need community support or paid agency support? Um, that's an important piece of planning these out. Um, so here we have Dan's community experience. He volunteered in marketing business in 2021. He is currently employed with satisfactory employment evaluations in 2021 and 22. And he's in the Boy Scouts, which is helping him develop leadership and independ independence, that should be independence skills in 2020 and 2021. So some daily living skills that we could be thinking about preparing meals. Um, Colette talked about, you know, one of the years that her daughter was in high school that she was responsible for one family meal a week, cleaning it out, helping to shop. Um, and that, you know, helped her, you know, learn that process of things. So budgeting, that's a big one that, you know, we all need um, reminders about maintaining a home. What does that mean? What is, 
How often should you clean your bedding? How often should you wipe your counter? Um, caring for themselves or their clothing or their pets? Do they need to be taught how to do laundry or do they need, you know, um, do they have uh, a pet fish that they want to take care of? So those are all things that could be part of that daily living. Um, and here we have Dan's. He took financial match class. That's my second typo to learn money management skills in 2020. And he's also the primary caregiver for the family dog in 2020, 2021, and 2022. So 9G, if 9F is the bane of my existence, 9G is like its little sister because this one can ruin a beautiful transition plan in two seconds flat. So, if you have other agencies that are involved in transition work for your students, you need to make sure you have parental consent to invite them to the IEP meeting or consent from the student who's reached the age of majority. Consent is needed prior to the advanced written notice going out, and it's needed at every meeting where the transition planning is discussed. So it's not a one and done at the beginning of the school year. So here's an example. We have a voc rehab. So again, if we saw this, we would be like, oh, voc rehab, awesome. Can you show us the parental consent to invite them, et cetera? Or you can put NA. What you cannot do, please, is leave it blank. Do not leave this blank. We see some really lovely transition plans and we're like, we get to 9G and we have a bulleted list and we're getting all excited. Or we get to 9F and we see that bulleted list and we get all excited and then we turn to 9G and it's blank. So please don't leave it blank. So parents can invite whoever they like to the meeting, as you all know. So here's an example of a written notice. And you can see that Mr. Purple, the vocational rehabilitation counselor, was invited by the parents. That way, we're not going to go look for that parental consent because we know that the parents were the folks who invited that person. So we also talked about how in the written notice, we need to see some sort of conversation about the transition goals. And this is just one example. Um, I'm sure there's a thousand ways you could do it. So you can see that in section one, there's just one statement that his, his plan was updated, reviewed, and accepted by the team. And then in section two, it gives some more information, some more detail about what that really means um, and what that conversation was. And then section 10, the age of majority. So this is where you indicate the date the child and the parents were informed of the transfer of rights, which would be age 18 in, in most cases. This should be completed at or before the IEP meeting for the child turning 17. And obviously this date doesn't change. The date you phone them was the date you phone them. So a reminder, purpose of the meeting, advanced written notice, child's invited to the meeting with the advanced written notice. The agency is invited with the prior consent, that's the advance written notice and section 9G, please don't leave it blank. Post-secondary goals updated annually in the written notice. We look for age appropriate assessments in 9D. Uh, we look for the goals in education training, employment and independent living in 9C. It's actually, it's not 9D. Actually, the assessments are, are marked wrong here. I need to go back and fix this. Okay. But the measurable post-secondary goals, uh, course of study is 9E, and transition services are not child will statements. So I think this is the one that's wrong. That one is not 9D. Okay. So some takeaways. Transition plans should be student-centered and family engagement is key, but we know it's very challenging. Assessment, assessment, assessment. Students should be invited and encouraged to attend their meetings and any outside agencies who can aid the child in their post-secondary transition should be part of the IEP team. So there's one that I missed and it's the first one. And I realized it when I got like 
two slides past it, and I didn't want to mess anybody up. If you are a freshman in teacher, a special education teacher, and you're responsible for transition plans, you get a child in, their annual is in mid-September, you've never met them before in your life, what you can do is have the annual IEP meeting and tell the team that you want to do, um, you know, assessments and make that transition planning meaningful because Maine says by the end of the ninth grade year. So you can talk to the team and if they agree, document in the written notice that you're going to meet again in May and you're going to have that transition plan written for the team to look at to amend the IEP and include that. So as long as that happens by the end of um, the ninth grade year, you're good to go. We talked about um, doing a lot of exploration activities if the child wants to be something that um, might be a little bit challenging, interviewing folks, et cetera. We talked about being generically specific just in case the child doesn't get a job at McDonald's, for example. Um, we don't want the parents to come back and be upset about that. Can you include the parents in 9F? Absolutely. You can absolutely put that the child attends, I don't know, um, youth services at church with their family, for example. Um, and another one, what to do if the parents don't encourage the child to consider employment? This is a sticky one. And it's one that I didn't even ever know about until I started working at the department. Um, and I think that really trying to have those positive interactions with the parents, really trying to um, you know, help the child advocate for themselves and have the parents as part of the planning process as much as possible to see the benefits of it um, are some ways that you can make that process a little bit easier. So what do we want to do? We want to promote ambitious outcomes for youth. Don't see anything in the chat box. So we're going to talk about our resources now. These are all online resources. So what are some benefits of self-determination? This is an intact slide you can see. People with greater self-determination are healthier, they're more independent, they're more well-adjusted, and they're better able to recognize and resist abuse. So having training in self-determination is important, it's an important part of that process, the transition process. So what is a resource you can use for that? The Zaro Institute at the University of Oklahoma has this entire uh, curriculum about lessons for teaching self-awareness and self-advocacy, and it's all online. You can access everything right there, and it is free. So it's a great curriculum that you can access to help with those um, self-determination skills. And this is just one, um, the example of one lesson. It tells you what the objectives are, what the purpose of the unit is. So it's a good curriculum that really goes through and it gives you the resources that you need to print off and use um, to use for the curriculum. So there's not a lot of um, prep other than like, you know, just print, printing things off that you really need to do. The PACER Center ha has great resources about advocating for um, students learning to advocate for themselves. And in fact, the PACER Center has a ton of really good stuff related to transition that's, you know, even above, um, you know, the self-advocacy stuff. So they're a great resource to, um, to look at programming as well. So this is a transition guide from May of 2017. This is the site right here. Um, and this is about supporting student-made decisions and prepping for adult life. This is just one section of this guide, though. Um, I wanted to put it here because I liked, you know, it, um, it had alignment to the self-awareness piece and self-determination piece that I was talking about, but it's a whole guide that has other pieces as well that you probably would find helpful. 
So this is another NTACT resource that they talk about and it's lifecoursetools.com. And it is all about person-centered director directed planning um, for life course framework. So it talks about safety and security, what to do in an emergency, um, social and spirituality, for example. So there's some great stuff in there. So this is another Pacer Center thing, and here's the link. Um, my IEP owner's manual for transition age students. I loved this. Like this is like a packet that you can go through. Um, I mean, or if you had a kid that was, you know, more independent, they could go through and really look at their IEP, the whys and the hows and, and how that's going to translate for them into post-secondary learning. So it's really about that student engagement piece. So then there's this one, the Pennsylvania Youth Leadership Net Network Secondary Transition Toolkit. And as you can see, phase one is accepting yourself, phase two is declaring yourself, and phase three is empowering yourself. This is from 2012, and I have not found an updated version. In fact, the first edition was in 2008, but it's good stuff. So. Um, if any of you come across, if any of you are transition geeks and you come across one that's been updated even more, please let me know. Um, so this is the National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. This has a lot of resources for families, parents, and caregivers on it, although it also has, you know, youth as well. Um, but there's a lot of different tabs here, and it gives a lot of links to like one pagers. Um, and things like that that can help. Okay, the QuickBook of Transition Assessments. So this is from Ocali, and this is the first page of the Table of Contents. So this is um, a fairly extensive resource, but you can see it's a PDF, so you, you can print it off. Oh, there's a question. Could you clarify? We should be inviting every high school student to their IEP meetings, correct? Yes. Yep, you should. Um, and you can see that this goes through independent living, recreation, leisure, community, post-secondary life and lifelong learning, transition, transition roadmap, and then it's got lots of one-pager assessment tools. This is the second page of the table of contents, talks about functional skills, different functional skills inventories. So this is, you can print this right off and, um, and look at these inventories with your kids, do these assessments, and it's free. Here's another one. So Wisconsin is doing really nice things with transition. They got a big grant um, several years ago, and this is one of the resources that they came out with. Um, and you can see, so this one is really, it's all linked. So if it has a couple of um, dollar signs, it means obviously you have to pay for that one. And you can also see how many of them are free. You just click on the links and it will get you there. And then my ultimate favorite is Tennessee. Tennis, Transition Tennessee is a fantastic resource. You need to create an account, but it is free. <coughs> they do tons of educator um, training and uh, resources as well. They do give out contact hours for any of their things that you, you know, that you watch. Um, and there are student portals as well. So there's activities that students can go in after they set up their own um, account. But the assessment database is the thing of dreams. I mean, you use all of these filters to decide like what you wanna look at for assessments. I love that it has different languages here. Many of the assessments come in those languages. It asks you who is gonna complete it, whether there's a cost, et cetera. So I just did a quick example of some social skills ones. I wanted to know about preferences, interests, strengths, and needs. I wanted to see whether they were interest inventories, checklists, or rating scales, and surveys. I just did English because that's all I know how to do. And I did no cost. And it comes out with pages and pages of results. And if you click on them, they give you what the information is. So this is a 315 item assessment. 
completed by a parent or educator that addresses money management, health, independent living, et cetera. So it tells you, so if I was looking for things that I was gonna do with a kid, I probably would be like, huh, first of all, it's for parent or educators. And third of all, well, second of all, 315 items long, like that's a lot. So that might not be one that I would wanna look at. Um, but it gives you, uh, you know, snapshots about the assessment. Who should fill it out? Here's a link to the assessment. When we go to the link to the assessment, that's what we get, the life skills inventory. And you can print it right off and do it with your kids. So explorework.com is about mapping the future. And that is one that I believe Vogue Rehab uses as well. So your kids might have a login to that if they have a Vogue Rehab counselor. This is career one stop. If I were still in the classroom, first of all, it also comes in Spanish, which is fantastic. If I were still in the classroom with my high school kids that I had personally, I would use this as a career exploration activity for them. I would give them a graphic organizer and I would say, pick two videos and fill out this graphic organizer and tell me because the videos go over, like, what are the benefits for this job? What are the normal salaries, et cetera? So there's lots of good information there. Uh, destination occupation is another one that folk rehab uses. So if your kid has a folk rehab um, case manager, you can talk to them because you can use their login to do these activities in the classroom as well. Transition assessment. So this is NTACT, the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, the collaborative. And so this is the link to their big a uh, picture training module about transition assessment. And they're another website you could get lost. If you're a transition geek, there's good stuff. Um, this is back to Wisconsin. So this was um, age appropriate transition assessments and resources. And there is the link on there. Wisconsin also has self-directed transition planning lesson plans. So you can see that it goes through all of, it has 15 lessons, it has transition bell ringers, opening doors, so a guide to using the lessons. So this is something that is, is already done for you, so you can familiarize yourself with it and use it as a resource for your transition kids. This is another Wisconsin one. This is about becoming a self-advocate. So this is a whole curriculum about from their Wisconsin suite of self-advocacy resources. And here we go, here it is. It's a new way of thinking, a guide for students with disabilities to develop self-advocacy skills. And this is printable. And this is the table of contents. So you can see that um, what I really, really like about this is that it starts out in chapter one with, guess what? You have a disability. Whoa. <laughs> and then it talks about, how do I talk up to the kid about what their disability is? What does that mean for you? You know, what does that mean for me, et cetera? So it goes through having those conversations so the kids can learn about their disability and feel empowered. All right, and I have to predict we're almost done. Got a couple more slides. So this is another transition um, TA. So this is an intact, and this is for schools to use to develop collaborative relationships in the community with businesses. So this goes through lots of tips and tricks to how you as a school could potentially set up um, a job shadow or um, you know something along those lines with your kids um, with you know, businesses in your community. So one thing that I don't want to forget about, and it's not, you know, it, it's not a solely a school responsibility um, to, to think about these things, but we don't want to forget the soft skills. And, and sometimes we do, right? So some soft skills we could think about are time management, situational awareness, ambition, friendliness and manner. So those social pragmatic pieces. So these are all things that employers are really looking for, for soft skills that we may take for granted that our kids are learning other places and they may not. 
And then this was something that I found on Pinterest at the very beginning of COVID. So a couple of years ago that I was like, oh my gosh. And Colette had, I think, I think her daughter was like 16 at the time. And I showed her and she was like, holy moly. I don't know if I've ever taught her how to, I don't know, um, seek counsel from someone more experienced. I don't think that was really the one that she was thinking of, but there's different soft skills here that, that, that are considered old fashioned, but kids need to know what these things are. So um, it might be worth our while to talk about them. So what I wanna leave you with, I have a couple more slides about sort of broader things, but compliance is not the end goal of education. And I, I, that, I saw that somewhere and it just really struck me, especially as it relates to post-secondary transition. You want to use, your time is so valuable and there's so little of it that, you know, using it wisely and meaningfully to do this transition planning with your kids will help both of you in the process to feel okay about it and feel good about it. So we have office hours and we do lots of fun stuff at office hours. And we're even gonna have some guest speakers in the spring, which is pretty, ex pretty exciting. Um, but our next one that we're doing on 1026 is about distinctly measurable and persistent academic and functional skills and a how statement. You can get to those, the calendar here to sign up for those. These are all the resources that we include um, in all of our PowerPoints. So that's the professional development calendar. This is a link for all of our recordings and PowerPoints that are archived. I think we've covered just about everything so far, and we're just continuing to add to it. Uh, DOE, special ed resources, laws and regulations, and then um, all of the required forms and reporting. Okay, so I'm going to ask Jennifer and Carly to help me out with this. I might need you to help me out, but we'll see. So we started a new thing two weeks ago. Jennifer and Carly are extremely smart and they have hooked up our um, little survey to this QR code and Carly already put that link in the chat box as well. It should only take you a couple minutes and it's because we really want the PD that we do with you guys to be helpful. So please be honest. Um, Jennifer and Carly, what else do I need to say about this? Um, so the, it'll have a drop down list of the training for today. So please just click on the one for the B13 transition planning. That'll help you get the correct materials emailed to you. Um, and just be careful when you're entering your email, make sure you spell it correctly because it's automatic. So it'll go directly to you as when you put that email in. So this is how you get a contact hour. Well, a yes. contact hour and a half, because this is about a 90 minute thing. Um, yes. So yeah. Anything else that we need to know there? No? Okay. I don't think so. I also, it's also automated that you'll get a copy of the PowerPoint and some links like to the office hours um, and the procedural manual and user and Oh, and our IEP quick reference document that is super okay. useful tool. All right. Does anyone have any questions that didn't make it into the chat box that they wanna come on and ask? This is all of our information, including Carly. <laughs> Sorry about that, Carly. Uh, we love to get emails from you guys. We do our best to get back to you within a day or two, although sometimes there is a lag. Um, but we are happy to answer questions. If you have specific questions about goals, for example, then we ask that you um, just send them in an email and either take out the name or make up a name. Um, because if we see an actual IEP, when we see non-compliance, we have to ask you to ask you to fix it. 
But if it's a pretend IEP goal, then we can just give you feedback about compliance and everybody's happy. So without further ado, I think that's it. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone. Thanks.